Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Tinfoil Helmet, the series where I just let loose and have fun with some of my favorite conspiracy theories. I began my YouTube journey by breaking my head out of the dogma of religion, embracing science and logic, and rejecting the Bible. Certainly, a lot has happened since then. I still don't believe in the God of the Bible, but kind of come full circle on this whole thing here. I'm starting to notice that there might be something more to the universe than what science can describe. And I've also come to realize that some of the stories in the Bible, and I mean the really, really crazy ones, are actually true. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, RAID SHADOW LEGENDS! So what is RAID? It's an epic dark fantasy done right. A hero collection turn-based game with over 400 champions for you to collect and personally customize. Look, I know you've heard of RAID before, but it's the most ambitious and genuine mobile RPG experience and it has completely changed mobile gaming. And the game is crazy popular with over 15 million downloads in the last six months. You can choose what to prioritize. You can either gather orcs, knights, elves, and more to assemble your team. And you can join one of 16 factions, discover 13 different locations, or you can just go around raiding with your friends in a clan. And the best part is that it's free to play. Actually, the best part is the multi-battle auto mode. You can set your battles to run in auto mode while you do something else! Spend less time grinding and more time developing your teams and focusing on the really fun battles. And don't worry, you'll never get bored. There are weekly tournament events, fighting in the PvP ring, fighting in the arena, running special dungeons, and they've recently released a roadmap which teases a lot of new content to come out in the next six months, including a new faction, a tag team arena feature, and even a new clan boss you'll be able to fight with your clan mates. So what are you waiting for? Click that special link in the description below. By using my link you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. You guys can find me in game as Skeptic TM. Good luck and I'll see you there! Ah! In my first video in the series, I pointed out some enigmas in history and suggested that our current knowledge of the progression of humanity isn't exactly accurate. I talked about how a comet hit Greenland somewhere around 12,000 years ago at the beginning of the last ice age, and this would have caused a large cataclysm culminating in a giant global flood. It wasn't just Noah who recorded a flood story. Dozens of cultures around the world have similar flood myths, even cultures that had no contact with each other. We used to believe that civilization began around 6,000 years ago with Sumeria, but we recently found a site called Gobekli Tepe, which dates back around 11,000 years. And to put into perspective how long ago that was, uh, Jesus was 2,000 years ago? Well, Sumeria was three Jesuses ago. For as long ago as Sumeria was for us, Gobekli Tepe was for the Sumerians. But even the Sumerians knew they weren't the first civilization. They told us about the older civilization. We just couldn't have known it would be that old. Recently, I've heard a lot of conspiracy theorists suggest that Gobekli Tepe was actually founded by the survivors of Atlantis and that Atlantis predated that. The site appears to have rock carvings that some people have interpreted to be depicting a comet impact. I absolutely believe that the concept of civilization existed before Gobekli Tepe and was taught to us by a mysterious group. From what the ancient Egyptians refer to as Zeptepi, or the first time. So who were these givers of civilization. Well, according to the Bible and the Book of Enoch, it was the Watchers, or the Fallen Angels, the Sons of God, and they came down and took daughters of men as wives. Human wives. Yes, it's all true, and I will prove it. They called these Watchers and their hybrid offspring the Nephilim, or the men of old, the men of renown. Another translation for that word is 
giants, which is technically a mistranslation of the word, but I assure you, they were giants. According to Enoch, in his books, it was the Watchers that taught us everything. They taught us how to work stone, make tools, make weapons, make war. But probably most importantly, they taught us astrology to help us tell the times and the seasons, which is also the basis for all of our religions. Some of the oldest Paleolithic cave paintings depict a large, white, giant race of alien looking beings. Multiple cultures around the world have similar stories about giant albino people who came out of the ground or out of caves and taught them everything. So is there any evidence that the Nephilim actually existed? That's right, motherfuckers, we're doing elongated skulls. We've all seen depictions of the evolution of humans. I think we can all picture in our heads how we can go from this, to this, to this. But how the hell do you go from this, to this? You can find elongated skulls in quite a few places around the world, but the two greatest concentrations appear to be Eurasia around the Black Sea and Caspian Sea area, as well as South America near the coast of Peru. You can probably find a handful of mainstream articles talking about some of these smaller conehead skulls. A lot of them are just normal humans who have bound their head. But some of these skulls are so large, you can't help but notice the discrepancy. That doesn't look like it's just head binding. I believe that these cone-headed giants served as a ruling class and they preferred to inbreed much as the ruling class does today to maintain their bloodline. But in Peru at least, over time, the skulls started off very large, but then slowly became smaller. Likely this is because they were forced to breed with the indigenous people they were ruling over more and more over time. So what the f even are these things? Are they even human? I mean, don't get me wrong, I love alien culture. I'm all about that Area 51 sh But there's no such thing as ancient aliens. A couple million years ago, the ancestors of we Homo sapiens started off as an ape-looking hominid, then evolved to fully upright-walking, tool-using humans to the civilization-living Homo sapiens we are today. Well, I have some bad news for you. This chart it's straight up propaganda. Don't worry, I'm not saying evolution didn't happen. It just didn't happen like this. First of all, have you ever thought of the implications of having Neanderthal standing behind Homo sapien in the line? That implies that Neanderthal is less evolved than Homo sapiens. And this is also supposed to implant a subconscious seed in your mind that more ape-like features equals less evolved. But Neanderthal was not less evolved than Homo sapien. Neanderthals were our closest cousins who shared a common ancestor with us going back about 500,000 years ago. When Neanderthal existed, they were literally exactly as evolved as we were. And Neanderthal only died off around 30,000 years ago, which is actually pretty relatively recently. Neanderthals were so similar to us that if they were alive today, they could probably just blend into crowded New York City, and you probably just think that there's some Italian mook. Hey, hey I'm walking walk walk in here. here. Yeah, you guys get it. Basically, as our ancestors' brains grew over the millennia, their jaw bones and jaw muscles had to shrink to accommodate the new skull size. The smaller their jaws got, the more space they had for brains. Gorillas have a fin on the top of their skull, and all the empty space around it where our brains would go is just a giant mass of jaw muscle. Basically, this chart is trying to place waspy Western Europeans as the peak of evolution and imply that anybody with more ape-like features like a prominent brow, a sloped back face, an oversized jaw, 
giant ears. All of these features become justifications to treat people like they're less intelligent, less evolved, less valuable. For example, even today, I've seen people use this conception of beauty to poke fun of the more defined features we see in the skulls of aboriginal people that live around the oceanic islands of Australia and New Zealand. I remember as a kid hearing that the reason that the oceanic people look this way was because their ancestors interbred with Homo erectus, but I don't buy this. Certainly they would have more unique Homo erectus DNA because they were an isolated people. They had actually been isolated in those islands for 50,000 years. But also the hooked bone on the bottom of the skull called the mastoid process, it's very pronounced. Almost more pronounced than this waspy ass looking skull that they put it next to. However, Homo erectus didn't have a mastoid process at all. So if they interbred with Homo erectus, that bone should be a little bit smaller. No, 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 no. The large hook bone, the prominent brow, these are all features of another Homo species. Scientists that study the aboriginals now still maintain that they have unique DNA, but it's because they've interbred with some other unknown, unidentified hominid group. Well, I know who they were. They were these large ape-like people who had cone heads and large protruding jaws. This is one of their idols. The biggest mystery is even though that this ethnic group was completely isolated for 50,000 years, the vast majority of Australian Aboriginals speak a language that was introduced only 4,000 years ago. Well, yeah, it could be a mystery, but it's not. It's these giant cone-headed people. They taught them the language. Now we Homo sapiens shared the earth with Neanderthals and other human species for tens of thousands of years. And I know that it's your instinct to assume that everybody back then was way dumber than they are today, but that's not true. They were all exactly as self-aware and intelligent as you are. Neanderthal, for example, had upwards of 10 or 15% more brain mass than the average human. I know that does not mean that they're smarter. And also we interbred with many different species of humans. Almost everybody on earth except for sub-Saharan Africans have Neanderthal DNA. And all of this interbreeding we've done over the years is what has resulted in what we now call Homo sapien. Archaeologists and anthropologists will tell you that these are normal human beings who have had their heads bound after birth so that their skull would grow into a cone shape. And though that certainly seems to be true for the vast majority of these skulls, there are a few that are so large Number one, the largest of the elongated skulls have at least 30 or 40% larger brain capacity than a modern human. This was tested by filling some of these skulls with rice and then measuring the volume that fit inside. Binding a skull will not make the brain grow 30% larger. This has to be a genetic trait. Number two, when we're born, our skulls are segmented and soft. As we grow up, it fuses together and hardens, leaving suture lines. These larger skulls are missing their sagittal suture line completely. Head binding will not do that. That has to be a genetic trait. Number three, the foreman magnum is the hole in the bottom of your skull that connects your brain stem to your spinal cord. Normally, it's somewhere near the center of your skull, helping to balance the weight of your head on your shoulders. However, on elongated skulls, it's almost all the way to the back. This accommodates for the extra weight for the larger skull. And it appears on some of these skulls, the foreman magnum is even smaller than a normal human skull, suggesting that they had very thin skeletons, which seems to be the case in the few surviving examples of full skeletal remains. And the head of their infants is almost the exact same size as their torso. This is insane, it's so alien looking. Binding a skull will not change the size or location of a foreman magnum. That has to be a genetic trait. Number four, many of the larger skulls have extra holes on the tip of the cone near the back. These were almost certainly holes for blood vessels. Their brain was so large that a second blood supply was needed to feed the top. You do not get this from binding a skull. This has to be 
genetic. Number five, the mastioid process. That little hook on the bottom of the skull I was talking about before. This bone is actually an anchor point for several of the muscles in your neck. These hooks are noticeably larger on the elongated skulls, much thicker. And again, this is to accommodate their larger head size. Head binding does not make these bones larger. That has to be a genetic trait. Number six, their lower jaw is enormous. This one's not really so much a rule, but I have noticed that quite a few of these skulls have jaws that would put Arnold Schwarzenegger to shame. But all that being said, the skulls are so perfectly round that on top of being genetically larger, I'm convinced that they also practiced head binding, probably by wrapping something flexible around their head like a leather strap. At first, it's possible that they were doing this to fit in better with the indigenous people that they were ruling over, but then as their heads got smaller and smaller, it became a way to differentiate themselves more and more from the native people. Number seven, they have an enormous ridge on their forehead like a giant plate. My theory is that this is a sign of head binding. A lot of the bone that would have otherwise have grown outwards ended up growing up like say a giant ape-like brow bone. Doing this would also stretch the eye sockets up and back, which is why their eye sockets are so large. And number eight, quite famously, Native Americans have dark black hair. Yet, most of the elongated skulls that still have hair have red hair. Some of them are blonde. I do not believe that this is an alien, but this guy isn't entirely homo sapien either. I'm forced to conclude that he is, at very least, a human hybrid. And yes, these are the real mummified remains of a Peruvian conehead. These people gave the Australian Aboriginals their language 4,000 years ago, before showing up on the shores of Peru 3,000 years ago. When I finally got around to looking at artist renditions of these people, it sent a lightning bolt through my brain. I started scouring the globe for signs of these people and I knew that it was my destiny to uncover who they were. When I was done, I was genuinely surprised by how many, many ethnicities these people influenced and even interbred with over the millennia. It all started when I noticed the similarities between the Paracas people and the Easter Island heads. Like the cone-headed leaders of Peru, Easter Island also had a ruling class that was ethnically distinct from the natives. We call them the long ears, and they gauged their ears. You know gauging when you put a giant disc in your earlobe and stretch it out? That's another way that they were differentiating themselves from natives, showing that they had different physical features. So my theory is that these statues did not depict gods, they did not depict ethereal beings, but instead each one of these represented a specific person, like whoever was king or ruler or priest at the time. Perhaps the natives worshipped these people as gods, but they were real freaking people. There were different designs created over the years. The earliest ones were very blocky, and then they eventually evolved into these overly cartoonish ones. The statues have big gauged ears that start at the brow line. They have a big sloped back face, oversized jaw, and their eyes are deep set with a large brow. Most people don't know this. Every single one of these statues is designed to have a second piece a large red stone that's placed on the head. When complete, these guys look exactly like the cone heads in Peru. Sort of like they've got a mass of red hair wrapped around a cone head. I believe that they were making these Easter Island heads cartoonish to overemphasize just how ethnically different the rulers were from the native people. Like they were showing off how godly their features were. And that reminded me of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who Egyptologists believe also overly cartoonified his body 
to differentiate himself from the people he was ruling over. However, I believe that he was emphasizing real physiological differences that he actually had. And honestly, I couldn't believe that I didn't notice this before. Just like the Easter Island heads, his statue has big ears that start at the brow line, a long sloped back face, an oversized jaw, deep set eyes, and also a funny beer belly. His statue is also depicted as wearing a giant cone hat, likely to make it appear as if he has a big cone head. In fact, most Egyptian gods and even many pharaohs were depicted as wearing long hats, and these long hats could easily be hiding cone heads. Akhenaten also often depicted his daughters and his wife Nefertiti as having long heads, and his son's skull, King Tutankhamun, is slightly elongated, but Nefertiti's skull was the largest of them all. Now, Akhenaten came way later than those big cone-headed people, but clearly he believed he was related to them. He was probably a distant relative, their bloodline preserved through the tradition of pharaohs inbreeding. The Easter Island statues also reminded me of something else that was kind of random, or at least I thought it was random. See, when they started digging these things up, they realized they weren't just heads, and the better preserved ones actually have arms that bend down and come together at their crotch. Their, uh, their hands are uh, clasping uh, they're gentlemen parts. Well, this is the oldest statue in the world. It was made at Gobekli Tepe. From the front, it seems eerily similar to the original Easter Island heads. It too has its arms bending down and he's holding onto his stuff. Well, technically this isn't the oldest statue in the world because a lot of these tea pillars at Gobekli Tepe are actually supposed to represent people as well. Maybe the exact same people. They too are made out of white stone. Several of them have arms that are curved down and their hands are clasping. And I know that these people and their religion made it to the islands of Australia because this pillar also is wearing a design on his belt. And this design can only be found in one other place around the world, in rock art created by the Aboriginal people of Australia. And it was at this point in my research that I knew I was onto something. So here's my timeline. You're gonna wanna pay attention to this. Gobekli Tepe is founded around 11,000 years ago. They create these white statues and white pillar people. Then, 2,000 years later, 9,000 years before today, the second oldest statue shows up in Jordan. Again, made from white stone, clearly a cone-headed figure, and there's several different versions of these, including a two-headed design, which might have represented a co-rulership or maybe Siamese twin Again, this confirms my theory that these are supposed to represent specific people and not the same ethereal god every time. Then, 2,000 years after that, 7,000 years ago today, these really weird ones show up, made from white stone again, and this time they have a separate material for the hair. Some of them seem to have lost the hair and just have a smooth cone, and it appears like they have alien eyes, but this is actually supposed to represent a prominent brow ridge and kind of a squint or maybe Asian eyes. And this isn't a reptile's beak, but it's a snout, like a big ape's jaw. Now this is starting to make sense. These are the same kinds of features that we see in modern gorillas. They too can develop a cone head, though it's mostly fat and muscle. And obviously gorillas have long slanted faces with a large prominent jaw. And this reminded me of a statue in Japan that ancient alien folks have tried to convince us are some kind of lizard people? No, again, these are ape features, caricaturized. These have to be the same people that we see in these Paleolithic cave paintings of giant white-skinned ape people. These are not aliens. These are albino ape people. These are members of a yet identified ape-like homo species. I'm dead serious. At first I considered that these were maybe Neanderthals or Neanderthal hybrids because my earliest research I found that Neanderthal is what introduced white skin, red hair, green eyes to the European people. But I've since 
change that theory. I remember hearing a theory a long time ago that the people that gave us civilization at Gobekli Tepe were the first human Neanderthal hybrids. Their strange genetic makeup allowed them unique physiology, including tall stature and oversized brains, allowing them to sort of think outside of the box from what humanity was used to. I didn't really think much of that at the time and kind of just forgot it. However, I started looking into another Homo species that was contemporary to the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthal called Homo Denisovan or Homo Denisovan. The Denisovan lived mostly in Asia. From the fragments of their bones and teeth that we found, these humans were absolutely massive. Their molars were so large that the earliest researchers dismissed them as bear teeth. In fact, their molars have twice the surface area of a modern human meaning that these Denisovans could have been as much as three times the mass of a modern homo sapien, like a giant. Okay, take a breath, everyone. Wh why don't you pause the video, go get a drink or something, because this is going to start to get heavy. One of the ways that our true history and our true nature is hidden from us is that we're kept distracted and fighting with each other based on a very narrow historical view. I'm not saying that we need to forget about our modern history. It's still very much relevant. But today, I'm challenging you to open your mind to a broader context of our history. I've said this before, but race too is such a narrow way to look at humanity. Race only really refers to your general skin tone, facial features, hair type, nose shape, and whether or not you fit in with other ethnic groups. But your race doesn't explain who you are or where you came from. When we see different ethnic groups migrating across the globe, we see their influence being left behind, like a trail of breadcrumbs. We see the influence that they've left on the land and on the people and on the culture. They leave behind art, religion, language, and of course, DNA. When two cultures meet, whether it's on the friendliest or on the worst of terms, they almost always interbreed. Humanity has survived for hundreds of thousands of years by continuously intermingling and clashing with each other, creating more distinct ethnic groups that would eventually take over each other and mix with each other and change with each other until eventually we came to one genetic identity. Homo sapien. And in that same vein, racial mixing today is a good thing. It helps bolster our genetics. This is literally how evolution works. Because I'm half Irish, my genetics are a little on the recessive side. If I want to ensure that I have strong sons, I need to find a big brown-skinned Amazon woman. I mean, it would be ideal if she was really able to kick my ass, you know what I'm saying? Even Alexander the Great, the most accomplished white Greek conqueror, told his generals after they took over Persia to take Persian wives. I went more into depth about this in my video, Inside We're All Black. Even though we seem to be racially very different, basically our racial differences are meaningless. The gene pool of the human species is worryingly shallow. Humans are so genetically similar today that our offspring are extremely predictable. If a white man marries a black woman, then the stork will bring them a brown baby. That's science. But species mixing is not so straightforward. If a sapien man marries a Neanderthal woman, then the stork's like, I don't know what to do. Nature allows for some species mixing if the species are similar enough, but it doesn't really have proper contingencies for it. For example, this is a liger, a mix between a lion and a tiger. In the wild, the tiger is the largest cat. However, in captivity, the liger is the largest cat. The liger is not just larger, it's cartoonishly larger. Now this is a tigon. A tigon is basically, genetically, the same thing as a liger, but a tigon shows completely different traits. A tigon has stripes and a mane, and the tigon is only about as big as a lion. Really, a tigon is just 
a lion with tiger stripes. Kind of boring in comparison. So how does this happen exactly? First of all, it's rare enough that interspecies mixing results in a viable offspring in the first place, but it's even more rare that that offspring ends up fertile and able to have their own children. But ligers and tigons are a special case. A liger is the result of a male lion mating with a female tiger. A tigon is the result of a male tiger mating with a female lion. It's believed that in lions, the female passes on the genetic trait that tells the body when to stop growing. And in tigers, it's the male that passes on the genetic trait that tells the body when to stop growing. So ligers are never given that genetic signal to stop growing and they just grow forever, whereas tigons get that genetic signal twice. So keep that in mind, all right? The first humans to leave Africa were the Homo erectus. By this point, humans had fire, tools, and weapons. They mostly lived in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, but some made it to Europe as well. Then came Homo heidelbergensis around 600 or 500,000 years ago. This is when things really start to change for humanity. Heidelberg basically took over everywhere, and we're reasonably sure that Homo sapien and Homo neanderthal both evolved from separate Homo Heidelberg groups. Homo sapien evolved down in Africa, of course, while Homo Neanderthal evolved up in Europe and Asia. However, at the same time, a third Homo group evolved in the Far East, the Homo Denisovan. And though Denisovan also evolved from Heidelbergensis, just like Sapien and Neanderthal, it appears as if their DNA didn't actually drift that far from Heidelbergensis. We expected that their DNA might be more like Neanderthal, but it ended up being way more like Heidelbergensis, which means that it's possible that Homo Denisovan looked almost identical or indistinguishable from the Homo Heidelbergensis, maybe even more similar than Homo sapien looks to Homo Neanderthal. We have no idea what they looked like. We've only found fragments of their bones. We don't even know what their skull was shaped like, but we do know that they were very large compared to modern humans. In fact, around 100,000 years ago, it seems as if gigantism was quite common. And uh, 100,000 years ago, this is around the time when Earth is the most like the Lord of the Rings. You got the Kingdom of Man coming up from Africa. Then you've got the red-headed dwarf people in Europe. And there's even a hobbit uh, around this time, Homo floriensis. And just like the white elves, there's a huge army of corrupt dark elves. There are these terrible giants that are roaming the earth. I left a link in the description to an interview with Professor Lee Berger from the University of Witwaterstand. It isn't really common knowledge, but a lot of the skeletons they were pulling out of the earth from around 100,000 years ago, on average, were over seven feet tall. So we know for sure of the existence of at least three different Denisovan groups that migrated across Asia. They might have even been three different species of Denisovan. And we know for sure that their descendants ended up migrating down through the Indonesian island chain. There's an ethnic group that exists there today that has the most Denisovan DNA of any ethnic group on Earth. And, uh, guess what? They have blonde hair. Isn't that interesting? So by using our skills of deduction, if there is a Homo sapien ethnicity existing today with Denisovan DNA, then that means at one point in history, there had to have been sapien Denisovan hybrids. What do you think those looked like? It's believed that Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal began mixing somewhere around 50,000 years ago. So it's reasonable, I think, to assume that Denisovan was also mixing with Neanderthal and Sapien at the same time. We've recently found a really good example of a Neanderthal-Sapien hybrid. She's apparently from around 30,000 years ago. This is also supposedly around the same time that Neanderthal went extinct. Hybrids have been around for at least 20,000 years at this point. But really, we don't even know when the last hybrids would have gone extinct. And the 30,000 year mark is also interesting because it's also this time in history that 
some really crazy shit starts popping up in Europe, including this iconic burial site. Now their burial uniforms are surprisingly intricate, including thousands of beads carved from mammoth tusks. This shows a level of sophistication that we didn't really know that humans had 30,000 years ago. And it's cool to see their ceremonies, like burying their dead with spears and other items. This jaw shape, one of the most amazing skulls I have ever seen. We know that Denisovans were at least as advanced as Homo sapiens, if not more so. For example, Wikipedia says that humanity discovered the drill somewhere around 35,000 BC. Well, this Denisovan bracelet is at least 8,000 years older than that, and it has an extremely precise drill hole. And the oldest sewing needle ever was discovered in the same Denisovan cave. Remains also show that these people were living in harmony with and even breeding with a group of Neanderthal. Though isolated, these were an extremely advanced people. Hybrid is a really wishy-washy term to use. Technically, this guy is a Neanderthal hybrid. So think about this. 30,000 years ago, we have sapien Neanderthal hybrids in Eurasia, as well as sapien Denisovan hybrids in Siberia and the Far East. Now get this, we used to believe that the first humans to cross the land bridge from Siberia into North America was around the last ice age, about 13,000 or 12,000 years ago. But there was a group of researchers that thought it had to have been much earlier. It was recently confirmed by artifacts found in a sinkhole that humans might have crossed the land bridge as far back as 25,000 years ago. I guarantee hybrids crossed that bridge. There are strange artifacts in North America from a culture that we know as the Mound Builders. And we call them the Mound Builders because they built earth mounds. It's pretty simple. But we don't really know much about them other than they were clearly ethnically distinct from the native groups that we know of today. So my theory is that the mound builders were the first humans that crossed the land bridge 25,000 years ago. However, they were being led by a group of Denisovan hybrids. There are several native tribes in North and South America that have stories of tribes of giants. Even though the Smithsonian denies it, there are several, several stories of people finding giant skeletons in or near these mounds or on their farm property. Even though it ends up in the newspaper and it becomes public knowledge, the Smithsonian will then come and collect the giant bones and then just pretend that it never happened. There are dozens of stories like that. There are, however, a few confirmed giant skeletons. And these people might have also have become the Almec, which was a culture that existed where the Mayan culture was before the Mayans. And the cultures, again, don't seem to be related. They have these giant bath salt or granite heads that they definitely should not have been able to work on. And though the granite heads seem pretty ethnically similar to the natives that live in North and South America today, their depictions of they're cone-headed babies. And they also liked to depict faces. Some of them look very, very Asian, way more Asian than modern natives. They created figurines, and those figurines have freaking cone heads. Unfortunately, the Peruvian cone heads didn't immortalize themselves with statues, at least none that we can find. It's hard to tell because the Paracas and Inca people were basically slaughtered by the Nazca people. They famously made that giant alien on the side of the mountain, and that was them basically trying to get the giant albinos to come back. But we do find later in the Inca period that they created these brass figures. Wouldn't you know it, they look an awful lot like the Easter Island statues. Then later in Mezcala, Mexico, we see the same style but kind of devolved. And what I find interesting about the Mezcala is we find here, again, another unique feature. There are several of them that are designed with a crooked 
or a cocked head. And this again confirms my theory that each of these figurines and each of these statues was supposed to represent a specific person. Clearly this was somebody who was born with a birth defect that made him walk around with his head sideways all the time. They probably would have recognized him as the crooked-headed god. They also had a sitting version, which is eerily similar to the wooden carving that we see from the Australian islands. Later, the Mayans would create their own sitting version, but most bizarre, the Dequi culture from Costa Rica. These are exactly like the OG statues from the Middle East. So I think that even though humans crossed the land bridge 12,000 years ago, the culture of the Coneheads and their religion didn't and landed on the coast of Peru 3,000 years ago. There they met the natives who by then had already been in the Americas for 9,000 years. I can do math in my head. And this is where you get the story of the ancient aliens, giving them the knowledge to farm and to create a civilization. Okay, so we know that the Conehead culture went from the Middle East down south and across the ocean to South America. We also know that they clearly went down to Africa because the pharaohs and the Akhenaten tradition. But do you think maybe a group went through Europe too? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Now this is actually the most mysterious group in human history. They were masters of the sea, rulers of the Mediterranean. They were known as the sea people or the Phoenicians. Every single Phoenician is depicted with a cone head. Every single one of them. Now we're talking way, way, way later, long after the Denisovans and the hybrids and the albinos and the Aryans and whatever you want to call them are gone. The ruling class of the Phoenicians seem to be descendants of the hybrids and are maintaining their traditions in the Mediterranean. In a future video, I'm going to explain who these people were, how they swept across Europe and changed the world forever. To make things a little bit more complicated, there's a separate native group in the Australian islands near New Zealand known as the Maori. The Maori showed up much later than the aboriginals and they're ethnically distinct, more Polynesian. There's one particular tribe in New Zealand that often is born with red or blonde hair, blue or green eyes, and they seem to have a completely different history from every other Maori group. They fled South America when the blondes and redheads were persecuted and were forced to cross the Polynesian islands through Easter Island, which is probably where they created the Easter Island heads, and then down to New Zealand, where they ended up creating a new culture. I'm leaving a link in the description to this documentary, but to make a long story short, this woman claims that her people left Egypt, sailed to the Americas, lived there thousands of years, then sailed across the Pacific Ocean, and then eventually landed in New Zealand. And though she never uses the term Phoenician, I believe that there were in the Americas about 3,000 years ago coincides with the Phoenicians time in the Americas. There are a ton of other oddities from around the world though, things that would put Ripley's believe it or not to sh fucking shame. Like the Boscop skull. This is pieced together based on fragments that we found in Southern Africa. I pray to fucking God that this was just a birth defect and that there's not like a whole species of these things. Jesus Christ. But based on the fragment, they would have had an enormous cranium and a tiny face, just like a little alien guy. And then there's this bizarre mummy that was found in the United States, only about three feet tall or so. And luckily this is a Tyrion Lannister type of a cone head, just a, a genetic defect from inbreeding too much. And then there's this guy. This is really creepy. He's only as long as my hand, but he appears based on his teeth and skeletal structure to be around six years old and the DNA is native South American. And she had a significant amount of European DNA as well. This is significant because it's officially believed that European DNA wasn't introduced to the Americas until Columbus landed, but apparently many of the elongated skulls have DNA that comes from haplogroups that are exclusive to Europe and the Middle East. So yeah. 
Good luck sleeping tonight. So in conclusion, I think I pretty much proved that the first people, at least the first civilizations, were governed by a non-sapien human species completely distinct from modern man. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I've proven it. However, as smart and as great and as capable and as strong and as large as these people were, they're not around anymore. They're a failed species. But it's probably a good thing that they're gone because for all the technology and the knowledge and the civilization that they gave us, they also subjugated us. And every single one of these cultures, every single one of these tribes, their story ends with the natives rising up and slaughtering the rulers. We killed them off and we became our own gods. It goes to show that no matter how accomplished and perfect a people may seem to be, they may still fail to survive. They may still fail to pass their genes on to the future. The Denisovans' DNA was not long for this world. And as they said at the end of Lord of the Rings, it's now the time of man. All the others are gone. Wait, do you think Lord of the Rings was about this shit? But many of us still carry the traits of Denisovan and some of us even clearly have their DNA markers. In fact, many of us might be direct descendants of them and not even know it. Hell, some of them might be direct descendants of them and know it. Oh my God! But don't go thinking that because you have Denisovan DNA or Aryan DNA, that that means that you're in some way superior you're not you're not them that was that was hitler's mistake that yeah his one mistake <laughs> hitler was so obsessed with albino features that he was venerating blonde hair and blue eyes he wasn't trying to bring back the traditions of the coneheads he was trying to bring back the coneheads aryan doesn't even mean white the iranians believe they're aryan that's what iran means Aryan. The Aryans are gone. Aryan features can be seen in several ethnicities from around the world. I've seen it in India, China even. I want you to Google this. You'd be surprised to find out that there are hundreds of examples of blonde and red-headed mummies all around the world. But Hitler, he went all around the globe trying to find signs of them. One of the places he went to were the mountains of Tibet. And this actually perplexed me until I realized about a month ago that the Tibetan mountains were the second place on Earth that they found Denisovan DNA. What a coincidence. From the mitochondrial DNA we've examined in the Siberian Denisovan cave, we know for sure that there are several ethnic groups in the Eastern Hemisphere who still show Denisovan DNA markers. Believe it or not, that includes three separate native tribes in South America not too far from where we find elongated skulls. But like I said, it seems as if the people who have the most Denisovan DNA are concentrated in the Indonesian island chain, mostly these, these blonde haired people. So I connected a lot of the dots on this religion and its migration, but did they show any signs of this religion in the Philippines or the Indonesian islands at all? Yeah, this is actually my favorite example. It's supposedly only about 1,200 years old, but it's clearly a cone head holding his wiener. So is that the culture coming back up? I don't, I don't think so. That, that thing is either older than we're told, or that religion ended up lasting like 10,000 years. Now I scoured this island chain for days. I found white ones, I found cone-headed ones, ones with big brows. But could I find one with big gauged ears?